nothing but a G-line, baby. New horns are gonna make people crazy. Denver turns a street into a park. If you like it, then it stays. CU's punishment for keeping domestic violence quiet seems a lot like a tax deduction. Another business at Colorado Mills reopens, giving us a new look at the damage. The mayor of Longmont denies that warrantless searches took place, yet even his police department says they did. And if you obey the sign, it could be the last decision you ever make. Next. Attention people with ears who live on the west side of town. The G-Line train starts long-awaited testing tomorrow with horns a blaring. RTD, of course, wanted to open that line in 2016, and then they told Next it would be by the end of 2017, and today they acknowledge that it might not open until 2018. If it's any consolation, though, the sound of people cursing will be drowned out by the horns. The horns along that heavily residential route through Wheat Ridge and Arvada out into unincorporated Adams County, the horns will not be going away anytime soon. Just ask the people living and working along the A-line if they still thought they'd be getting their brains rattled by horn blasts. But since federal regulators haven't signed off on the train to the plane's safety fixes, the city can't apply for a quiet zone designation to skip the horns along the A-line. And RTD tells us the G-line out west will open this year, next year, with horns blasting. And only once it opens like that, only then can the cities on the route apply for some peace and quiet. Hey, speaking of our old friend, the little train that couldn't, is the A-line working today? Happy to tell you that it is. It is running well the vast majority of the time. But now RTD is fighting its private partner on the project on whether there's technology existing to fix the A-line's remaining problems. Internal emails show how various leaders in Longmont reacted to our reporting of warrantless police dog searches for drugs in public housing. They reacted with false denials, plans for a secret meeting, and finally, a decision to stop answering our questions. Police didn't come to the suite's public housing in Longmont with a warrant. They had the suspicions of Longmont Housing Authority workers who asked for searches of eight apartments based on unverified rumors. We found a baggie outside today with something in it. The Housing Authority worker coordinating the searches, Alma Collins, admitted internally afterward, I was not aware that residents had to give consent for canines. Her boss knew that consent was legally required, but she's also the one who told us on camera that any resident who refused a warrantless search was immediately suspect in her mind. Internal emails show several tenants complained, yet police say no one ever refused to let them into search. Tamika McClure says she refused, and they searched anyway. They said the dog picked up on something between our dresser and a nightstand. When we made the searches public, and police said they were all done legally. We made it quite clear that we needed permission to go in. Longmont's mayor, Dennis Combs, was still in denial. He wrote to one concerned constituent, these searches never, ever happened. The city says the mayor later apologized for that false claim. Meanwhile, the housing authority hunkered down. Board members asked if they could meet without the public knowing. Board member Peter Linder wrote, if we give notices for a special meeting, you can bet that Kyle Clark will be there. And he also wrote, we may want to have in place now a protocol in place for answering questions from Kyle Clark or Nine News. I think a good policy for the time being is no comment. We haven't heard from the housing authority since. I think there's another internal email, though, that explains how all of this happened. Back in April, the head of the housing authority asked Longmont police to bring over the police dogs because it was working so well at their other housing facility. That facility, Briarwood. It's exclusively for people on probation, people who specifically give up their Fourth Amendment rights to refuse a police search. It looks an awful lot like the Longmont Housing Authority tried to use that model on all of its other tenants, without the Housing Authority leaders all understanding that those tenants have the exact same constitutional rights as the people in charge. The city is now asking for an outside law enforcement agency to investigate. CU football's winning streak extends to the punishment handed down to its leaders for sitting on allegations of domestic violence against an assistant coach. The penalties for football coach Mike McIntyre and athletic director Rick George, they're tax deductible. George and McIntyre will each donate $100,000 to programs that support victims of domestic violence. Depending on where that money is donated, those $100,000 donations could turn out to be tax deductions, so we're really not talking about a $100,000 hit to their wallets. We'll see what kind of donation CU ends up making to the woman whose pleas for protection were not handled appropriately. 
Another business at Colorado Mills Mall in Lakewood is bouncing back, which is a terrible joke because it's the Jump Street Indoor Trampoline Park. So we'd really just finished an upgrade to the facility and about three weeks later then we had the storm come through. So it really was devastating. And it's not the first time this roof has been through hail, it's just the one time it got it, you know. I went up on the roof, there's, there's a hole like this every four to six inches across 45,000 square feet. So it was awful, I've never seen anything like it. It was literally raining inside the building and everywhere. It wasn't just a leak here, a leak here. It was coming down in the building. I had the restoration crew in here. They actually tried to, to funnel off with plastic sheets and direct it into just areas. But, I mean, there was so much water coming in, it was just amazing. Uh, when you walk in, I think it's a great big puzzle just trying to figure out the parts and pieces and, and how to put them back, in, back together. So it was quite a challenge, but we had a lot of people helping us, and it really came together very nice. So, Honestly, I was hoping, like praying, that we could be open so soon. Like, realistically, I was thinking more toward the end of July, but halfway through June, man, it's, it's a miracle. Uh, when we looked at it the first time, we thought from the time that we got the space back, we thought we'd go six weeks. We're way ahead of that. We're about three weeks ahead of that. So we're going to go about three weeks from the time we, we got in here and started construction. So it's really been a fantastic effort. Like several other businesses at Colorado Mills, Jump Street gave its employees the option to work at other locations while they were closed there. Our next question comes from a viewer named Rob. I was running at Waterton Canyon where I saw sprinklers running at the Denver Water Caretakers residence. Why do they have manicured lawns up the canyon? Why don't they need grass that isn't there naturally? Rob, Denver Water says that it has three caretakers who live and work at Waterton Canyon in three separate houses. They maintain the reservoir up there. Some of those caretakers have young kids and Denver Water says they are allowed to have a small yard so that their families can enjoy the space. Denver Water pays for that housing in addition to a salary. It's because those caretakers are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365. So whenever something needs to be fixed at a reservoir, a dam, or a hydro plant, they go. The people in that van are tripping. They're road tripping. Hey, it's a family show, and this is a family adventure. We kind of feel like life is short. Uh, you should really go for it. Beautiful artwork for you to walk all over in Denver. Today, a canvas is a street. And a road sign in the foothills that's an invitation to a really bad decision. Next. Before Jeremiah Luce loses his teenage daughters to college, careers, and the rest of their lives, he's hoping for one last family adventure. That's how they ended up on the bus, leaving their home in Fort Collins a month ago to see America, staying at state parks and farms, and volunteering in communities along the way. We caught up with the family 20,000 miles later. And that's a 92 International. And that's a 73 VW, and I have uh, 12 solar panels that power uh, pretty much everything on there. Well, first, something that isn't visible that you can't tell about this, unless I pop the hood, is that we run the motor off of recycled vegetable oil. This is what the kids are calling tiny houses these days. This is the kitchen table right here. This is the bathroom right here. It's got all RV parts. This is the girls' bedroom. You're going to want to peek up the stairs. This is me in the wife's bedroom. This is, we pretty much just have a king-size pillow top bed, which we sleep well on. Every now and then somebody will look at us like we're super sketchy and we, it doesn't matter, it's all cool, it's all good. <laughs> Honestly, we just needed more room because we were going to go full time. We've been traveling for a year now and uh, I was going to build something and I thought it was just going to look weird and not hold up. So one night I had a dream I cut a van in half. So I just went looking for a van and found that at a junkyard. It was about to be crushed, it didn't have a title or a motor or an interior and it was destined to be crushed, so I bought the top half of it. I think it's awesome. I think they've definitely, uh, you know, instilled a love of travel in me. I think I, that's what I want to do with my life, travel. It, it, is, it is fun. Yeah, we enjoy it. Give the looses a wave if you see them on the road. Pretty distinctive though, right? Jeremiah runs an online business while they're traveling. He buys and resells books and DVDs that he finds at thrift shops along the route. Daughters are homeschooled on the bus. They're back in Fort Collins for a month, and then it's off to Montana and back to the Pacific Northwest.
Good travel weather across Colorado this week. Unlike yesterday, the weather is calm, beautiful. Blue skies, few clouds out there this afternoon, and temperatures a little cooler with the weak front that slid through. Winds that are gusty along the front range tonight will lay down just a little bit. All the severe weather off to the east of us. That's a tornado watch near Minneapolis. Severe thunderstorm watch from Omaha down to Lubbock, and that's a high wind warning near Casper, all due to that beautiful upper level low pressure system spinning so clearly on our water vapor imagery in Montana. It scoots off to the east tomorrow. Tomorrow, and that brings a drier northwest flow in. Sunshine, dry day, good travel, I-25 and I-70. No weather issues for about the next 48 hours or so. And that's saying something in the month of June, our severe weather month. And so in the Denver metro area for tonight, other than a few clouds, calm and quiet, or low, a very mild 50 degrees. Sun's up at 530 tomorrow. Quick jump. Southwest winds get us to almost 90. I think we will touch 90 moving into Thursday and Friday ahead of Father's Day weekend. A weak cool front coming in on Sunday. Slight chance for a storm, comfortable temperature in the mid 80s and uh, just a beautiful scene coming in out of the Colorado high country. Everything is just so green this time of year, Kyle. Kathy, thanks. This piece of paper proclaims today as Living Donor Day in Colorado. No piece of paper can express the life-saving gift being given by family, friends, and total strangers as our organ transplant waiting list grows faster than in most parts of the country. Uh, my husband and I struggled to get pregnant. Um, but we finally did, but I got very sick the, the 12 hours before Nolan was born. We had did an urgent C-section. I know I saw him, I have pictures of him as a newborn with me, but I, I don't really remember him till middle of June uh, 2015, even though he was born in May. Once I was strong enough and my infection went away, I could leave the hospital but my kidneys still weren't, weren't working. To be a brand new mother, to have a baby and not be able to truly be there for that child and not know if you're going to be there for that child, that's a pain that most people can't imagine. And I just knew, I, I knew God wanted me to do it. There was just such a peace in my heart. I just, I knew this was something I was going to do. Um, it was amazing. I've had friends and family offer to get tested, um, but this was a complete stranger. She, you know, she just thought about other people and, you know, wanted to help. And that that has always blown my mind about people. Ninety-five percent of the more than twenty-five hundred of our neighbors on the organ transplant waiting list could be saved by a living donor. They are waiting for a liver or a kidney. Denver wants to see if we like one block better as a park instead of a street. And the story of a very private billionaire in Colorado who owes his fortune to cheese. Next. The block of 21st between Lawrence and Larimer is nice and all, but Denver wants to see what that street would look like as a park. It's becoming a two-month pop-up park. The project may result in a permanent park there. Our photojournalist Mike Grady gives us a close-up of the centerpiece. If you can keep pushing this out for just a minute with that broom. I had this idea of why don't we actually paint a mural in the street. Yes, yeah, 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 please. Got recommended to work with Pat Milbury and his crew. The joys of street art. <laughs> that was actually good for you to be here for that little situation. Steven Chester, I'm a city senior planner with community planning and development with the city and county of Denver. Today, the canvas is the street. An abstraction of the Colorado flag. You have the C, which are all the different tones of the pink and the magenta colors. The yellow concentration of the flowers, the middle of the flag and the sun. We had a pretty extensive like back and forth design process in order for public works to okay like the palette we were using. Once the street's back open, this mural is gonna stay. We don't wanna confuse drivers about uh, you know, different street markings and what the colors means. Figuring out how, how it works. Creating on a multi-dimensional level is awesome. The best viewing point, point for this piece is from above. You know, for instance, chalk in like a shape of this design. So one of our team will be up top and they'll, they'll help provide like, oh yeah, let's, let's extend that curve a little bit more, or like bring that end out a little bit further. Like we see our flag, we see the car I'll see every day. It's how you interpret it and, how, and what you can do to, to throw your twist on it as an artist. Between Public Works and Pat's crew and uh, everyone else at the city, I think we've ended up with a 
really unique design here. I'm hoping it opens more people's eyes and imaginations to doing more like more, more street level pieces of art or looking at art from different perspectives like this. What a view. City says you're welcome to swing by 21st and Larimer to help volunteers plant flowers tonight. If you want some fresh air and a sense of community, seriously, it sounds like a really cool way to spend the evening with some people you've never met. May I make a recommendation, point you towards someone else's work that caught our eye today. There is a humble billionaire in Denver who, if you ask him how he got all that cheese, will tell you, cheese. Forbes has a fascinating article on James Laprino, who supplies mozzarella to Pizza Hut, Domino's, and Papa John's. The 79-year-old is so private, there isn't a single photo of him on his company's website. He lives a simple life out of the spotlight. He told Forbes he'd likely just pick up a hammer before calling somebody to help him fix something around the house. Laprino Foods started as a family grocery store in Denver's Little Italy neighborhood, and now the company is the world's top producer of pizza cheese, selling more than a billion pounds of it every year. It's a great article, even if you don't love cheese. There's a link on the next Facebook page. The most Colorado thing we saw today was a guy using his motorcycle to get up to a bike trail. All in a day's work, David Simmons emailed this one in to us. Saw the guy on 470 near Dakota Ridge High School. David said he had to go over and talk to the guy. He wanted to know how he rigged the whole thing up. And apparently, he told David he's trying to get used to not having a truck to carry around his mountain bike. So he just adapted his motorcycle into the most Colorado thing we saw today. Every now and then, you'll send us a sign that gets the entire next office laughing. We'll show it to you next. It's a sign spotted by next viewer Daniel Burkett, who thankfully did not follow the sign's direction because then Daniel would have plunged off the road into Clear Creek. The sign clearly points right. The road clearly points left. Daniel says he drives through the canyon three or four times a week, and he sees this sign every time. If a sign catches your eye, email it to us next at 9news.com or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. Feedback on our reporting from Longmont. Terry writes, just when I lost faith in journalistic integrity. Your pursuit of Longmont Housing Authority proves a great president. We appreciate it. April says, I thought Longmont PD was progressive and honorable. Curious they don't know the law. Got to be careful. There's no suggestion that the police department didn't know the law. It was the choice of the housing authority to combine mandatory inspections the tenants couldn't refuse with a police search that they could refuse. Tim Murphy says, Kyle, that's one ill-fitting coat you're sporting. Tim, I got fat coats and I've got skinny coats and this is a fat coat and I've lost a couple of pounds. And lastly, JR. As we approach Father's Day, your coats fondly remind me of Dad. I love that. See you next time.